In this lecture, we are going to look at just a few examples of the history of microbiology. I cannot cover all the important discoveries that were made in microbiology. We will look at just a few. Most were chosen with an ulterior motive. They highlight something we will come back to or will lead to something else worth talking about. This discussion will give you an appreciation of the past. Compared to many STEM fields, microbiology is a relatively young science having begun in the later half of the 19th century. As we go through this, you might notice that history is not linear. There will be discoveries that happen, and then it seems as nothing else happens for a long time, then there is a new rush of discoveries. This is because many discoveries need certain advances in other fields, such as microscopes, or plumbing, or steam fitting, or housing, or wealth and then people have the ability to make discoveries. Finally, these discoveries build upon each other, and hopefully you'll see some of that as we go through this. The first person to talk about in microbiology is always Thanis Philipsum, who used his pen name Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, which means Anthony from the lion's corner, and that was the port that he was near. It's called the Lion's Port, and so he used that pen name for his writings. He was inspired by Robert Hooke's work, Micrographia, and was an adept lens grinder. He was able to make lenses much better than those used by others at the time, and because of this, he could see smaller things. This led him to discover microorganisms in 1673. He wrote letters to the Royal Society of London describing his discoveries. His letters caused a sensation and he received many honors for this work. Interestingly, he lived to be 91. Here are some examples of what Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was observing. He looked at algae in lakes. He looked at little animalcules that we know now as protozoa. He even looked at blood and saw human erythrocytes in it. These are all images taken from a microscope very similar to the one that he used. I also find his writing entertaining as he was not an educated man, graduating only from an undistinguished elementary school in the village of Wartmund. He observed many things and described the diversity of life. Take a look at what he wrote that's listed on here and you can see that it kind of goes off on tangents and describing things, which is kind of fun. Okay, so what's special about Thanis? Why was he the discoverer of microorganisms? I think the most important factor was his ability to grind lenses, and he developed a superior technology that no one else had. And then also a significant amount of free time. He was a fabric merchant, and this gave him time outside of his job that he could use in these endeavors. Another important topic is in search of a better medium. These two people were in Robert Koch's laboratory. A lot of the work that Robert Koch did was using potatoes. However, potatoes failed to support the growth of many microorganisms, and Koch and his laboratory were constantly frustrated by the lack of a good solid medium. Walter Hesse joined Koch's laboratory to do studies on air quality and he showed a remarkable attention to detail in patients in his work. His wife, Angelina Fanny Hesse, would often assist her husband with his research in the laboratory. Walter was attempting to do his air quality experiments using medium containing gelatin as the solidifying agent. In the summertime, temperatures would often rise above the melting point of gelatin. In addition, Microbes would often grow in the cultures that were capable of degrading gelatin. In both cases, this would cause liquefaction of the medium, ruining the experiments. One day while eating lunch, the frustrated scientist asked Angelina why her jellies and puddings stayed solid even in the hot summer temperatures. She told him about agar agar, a heat-resistant gelling agent that she had learned about while growing up in New York from a Dutch neighbor and this neighbor had immigrated from Java. Development of the new agent by Angelina and Walter led to its resounding success. Few microbes are able to degrade agar and it melts at 100 degrees centigrade, yet remains molten 
at temperatures above 45 degrees centigrade. This allows the mixing of the agar with heat sensitive nutrients and microbes. After solidification, it does not melt until a temperature of 100 degrees centigrade is again attained, facilitating the easy cultivation of pathogens. It can be stored for long periods of time, allowing the cultivation of slow growing microorganisms. Any type of broth can be mixed with agar, giving great flexibility in the kinds of medium that can be made. Thus many more types of microbes could be cultivated. This discovery is so significant, agar is still used today as a solidifying agent and is a foundation technique in microbiology. Now we move on to wine and France. Louis Pasteur was a giant in microbiology, just as Robert Koch was. Pasteur was called in by the French wine industry that was on the brink of ruin due to wine souring. Ferm and fermentations at the time were thought to be chemical reactions that occurred when a liquid containing sugars was heated. Pasteur investigated this problem they were having. Their waste was, wine was coming out tasting sour. And he demonstrated that in fact it was a fermentation carried out by yeast that were part of the microbiota of the materials being fermented. The wine souring was caused by an unwanted contaminant that instead of producing alcohol was fermenting the sugar to lactic acid, a sour tasting compound. Pasteur solved the problem by heating the wine and killing the contaminant. The heating process was named pasteurization in his honor and is still used widely today to decrease the microbial load in many different products. In a brilliant step of generalization, Pasteur realized that souring of wine and infectious disease shared a common thread in that they both might involve infection by a microorganism. His suggestion that microbes cause disease became known as the germ theory of disease. This is one of the greatest advances of science and paved the way for the discovery of the cause of dozens of diseases that were plaguing humans at the time. Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, among others, demonstrated that specific microbes cause specific diseases. And once you know the cause of a disease, it is possible to start looking for effective treatments. Question for you. How do you think agar played a role in the discovery of the causes of infectious disease? Well, it turns out agar is a solid medium and you need a solid medium to then isolate microorganisms. If you can't isolate microorganisms away from one another, you can't figure out what the cause of a disease is. And this is one of the techniques that Koch used, and we'll talk about Koch's postulates later in the semester. Before the discovery of agar, many microorganisms could not be grown in culture and we could not identify the cause of many different diseases. We now shift our attention to smallpox. Smallpox was a feared disease that was highly infectious. Almost everyone eventually was infected with it and it had a mortality rate of 25%. It was 40% in children. The disease would begin with fever, discomfort, and fatigue. Eventually blister-like pustules would break out all over the person. If you survived the infection, you had a lifelong immunity to the disease. At some point in the 11th century, it was realized in India and China that the liquid from pustules of a smallpox victim, if given to another, would often result in a mild infection. This variolation, as it was called, gave lifelong protection against the virus. Lady Mary Wortley Montague, wife of ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, brought the practice to England. General George Washington even varioliated his continental army in 1776 against smallpox. There were problems with this treatment. Serious skin lesions inevitably resulted at the site of inoculation, and the fatality rate from varioliation was 1-2%. to 2%. In 1796, Edward Jenner, an English country physician, went in search of a more predictable and safer method of protection against the disease. He noticed that milkmaids rarely contracted smallpox. 
Further investigation revealed that they often contracted cowpox from their charges. Jenner hypothesized that cowpox was related to smallpox and contraction of the former would protect against the latter. In a classic experiment, and one that would land you in jail today, Jenner inoculated a young patient with cowpox and later challenged him with smallpox. The boy did not become ill and Jenner was responsible for the creation of a safer method of protection against smallpox. It is important to stress the nature of these diseases and their viruses would not be known for over a hundred years. Jenner was way ahead of his time. A fun side note to this is that Louis Pasteur would later discover the nature of this treatment. In other words, using a weakened pathogen to train the body against the disease when he was working on chicken cholera. Pasteur named the process vaccination in honor of Jenner. Vaca means cow. So two more questions for you. Why was smallpox so feared? And then describe Jenner's experiment. What was he testing? What was the control? And why is this experiment not as unethical as it first seemed? Why was smallpox so feared? Well, because it would kill so many people. It would kill 40% of children who infected it, 25% of adults. Jenner's experiment was to first inoculate a child with cowpox and see if that raised an immune response against it. He was testing whether it would raise an immune response against it. The control was that he inoculated other children with smallpox just straight ahead and didn't inoculate them with cowpox. Why was this experiment not as unethical as it first seemed? Because he was probably going to varioliate the child anyway. That was becoming a standard practice in England. And challenging him first with cowpox and then seeing that he didn't get sick when challenged with smallpox was a way of testing this, quote, vaccination. Okay, one last topic. Another discovery was brewing in the Western United States. In the mid-1960s, Tom Brock was on a trip to Yellowstone and became intrigued by the mats of green, brown, and pink material that were found in many of the hot springs. Brock was sure that these were living communities of microorganisms, yet the springs were at temperatures that were near the boiling point. Subsequent research proved his hypothesis correct and led to the isolation of a microbe, Thermus aquaticus capable of growth at 85 degrees centigrade. How these microbes survive at this temperature has to do with their membranes, the unique properties of their enzymes, and other things that we still don't completely understand. One of the tough enzymes made by this microbe is DNA polymerase. DNA polymerase in Thermus aquaticus was found to be extremely heat stable surviving temperatures of 95 degrees and copying DNA at 72 degrees. It was the first enzyme used in the technique of the polymerase chain reaction, a method that has revolutionized science. Note, this is used in the test for SARS-CoV-2, and SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19. I would like to end with an appeal for science. If you look at some of the discoveries that we have talked about, at first they seem to be esoteric, but led to revolutionary changes for human society. What does bad wine have to do with human disease? This fostered the germ theory of disease. Why are microbes in the colon important? This led to the discovery of Vashriki coli, and research on this microorganism has been instrumental in understanding the basis of life. Why support microbial research of the sulfur pots of Yellowstone? This dude's just trying to get a free vacation. Well, Tom Brock went there. He discovered Thermus aquaticus. Thermus aquaticus is an organism that has a very heat stable enzyme that's used in PCR, and PCR is used for diagnostic tests. The point is, funding basic fundamental research is very important. Okay, that's it for module one.